True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. I first met Hella Crafts in uh, the fall of 1986. Uh, she came in to see me and was discussing the possibility of a divorce uh, from her husband. She was very concerned about what was happening at that time. She was also concerned um, about potential violence, shall we say. She strongly suspected the affair. She uh, felt she knew who the individual was, but she really wanted some confirmation. So we talked about hiring a detective to prove that, in fact, yes, he was involved with another woman at that time. It was a typical scenario of husband is never home, constantly lying about his whereabout, and she had had enough. I met with her uh, several days after we had caught Richard with his girlfriend. And there were many photos of affection between the two. The friends were basically telling me that she had disappeared and that uh, she was not the type of individual who would do this. She had three small children. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. We've missed everyone. We had two weeks off, so it's nice to be back. It's really good to be back. I, yeah. I was getting withdrawal. <laughs> it was weird, yeah. Yeah, I agree. But we had fun. We found some good, uh, quiet places. Yeah, we got to collect our thoughts, and here we are starting fresh. Off and running. Yes. So, after suffering for years in an abusive marriage, Hella Crafts filed for divorce in the summer of 1986. Soon afterward, she disappeared. Her friends filed a missing persons report, but her husband, Richard Crafts, gave various stories that Hella was off visiting relatives or that she just needed some time alone. Police suspected foul play, but with no body, it was really impossible to prove that a homicide had even occurred. Police did learn, however, that Richard Crafts had purchased several suspicious items, including new carpeting, bedding, and a large freezer. And this was all around the time of Hella's disappearance. And he also rented a wood chipper. A witness did come forward claiming that he had seen a man using a wood chipper on a bridge over a lake near the craft's home. That is when the search for Hella took a very disturbing turn. Join us at the quiet end today as we discuss a horrific crime often referred to as the wood chipper case. Investigators, along with Dr. Henry Lee, the director of Connecticut's Forensic Science Laboratory at the time, worked together to solve what Richard Crafts had considered his perfect crime. I chose this case because it serves to broaden awareness of domestic violence, and also because it is chock-a-block full of interesting forensics from a pre-DNA era. Yeah, we're talking about blood type, and that's pretty much it. Yes, the 80s. Distant past. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't seem that distant to me, unfortunately, but... Well, it isn't in no. the grand scheme of things. That's true. That is very true. So I have a nice Connecticut beer for us. It's called Locust Rain. That's R-E-I-G-N, not R-A-I-N. Of course. And it's from <laughs> New England Brewing in Woodbridge, Connecticut. It's a New England IPA, so we expect it to be kind of on the fruity side. And it is, although kind of surprisingly, it's it's not a total fruit bomb. So it's a hazy, dark yellow color. It's got a nice inch or so of, a, of white head, a little bit of lace. Mostly a pine and floral aroma to this. And a little bit of fruit, but mostly the pine and floral. Got a biscuity taste, pine, and some late hops that are more floral. Tiny, tiny bit of grapefruit. Maybe some tropical fruit, but... Mostly the pine and the, the floral essence. Pretty nicely hopped. The, the hoppiness kind of lingers on, so we can appreciate it. Well, that's the way to do it, right? Not too bitter. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to try it. I just had that sour beer we bought, which wasn't super sour. It was kind of a summery one. So I'm anxious to try this one now. Well, this one will be a lot different for you. If yeah. you were talking about that dogfish head one, the Festina Pichet. Yeah, a little bit tart, but not a true yeah. sour, right? Right. 
but this is anything but a sour. Okay. Well, let's open it up and enjoy it. Okay, come on down to the quiet end. It's nice to be back, and I'm going to have you start our story. I will. So Hella Crafts was born Hella Lork Nelson in 1947. She grew up in a small town north of Copenhagen in Denmark. Her mother Elizabeth, called Liz, or Lis, her mother Elizabeth, called Lis, was a secretary in a school, and her father Ib owned a gas station. Now, Ib had been active in the underground during the Nazi occupation in World War II. So in the underground, that means he was saving people. He was saving people. Well, that's really cool. He had, though, a, a harsh outlook on life. Well, I mean, that kind of thing probably could make you feel that way. I imagine it could. Mm-hmm. Now, when Hella was seven, her parents were divorced because her father had a mistress. Well, sometimes that happens. Her parents did get back together and remarried when Hella was in her 20s. Now, they gave a lot of attention to Hella, who was their only child. Her father gave her horseback riding lessons. Her mother brought her the most expensive clothes, especially shoes, because her belief was that good shoes would give her daughter strong feet. I never heard that one. I've heard things like that. I think my grandmother, who was Polish, it was important to her to have the right kind of shoes for your feet. So. Well, I don't disagree with that. Yeah, but it's kind of a, a weird thing to really think about. It seems to me. So Hella was a good student, and she is popular with most of her teachers and fellow students. She studied in England, lived as an au pair in France, and attended interpreter translator school in Copenhagen. She spoke Danish, English, and French fluently, and a couple other languages less fluently. In 1967, when she was 20 or so, she worked as a flight attendant and she flew the African run out of Brussels and Frankfurt. When Pan Am advertised in Copenhagen for flight attendants, she was one of eight Danish girls selected from over 200 who had applied. Pretty good. That's impressive. And because of her previous experience, Hella was really the star of her Pan Am class in Miami. The thrill of her working life included learning new cultures and meeting new people, of course. And she was described as very cheerful, very independent, but reserved. Maybe it was a Scandinavian trait, but Hella didn't easily open up to anyone about her personal life. She didn't tell her girlfriends any intimate things about the men she saw, you know, if she'd had sex with them, if she was going to see them again. She kept all that kind of close to the vest. In Florida, the group in training lived together near the Miami airport, and this is where many pilots would go to pick up women by the pool. In May of 69, this is where Hella met her future husband, Richard Crafts, and her attraction to him was immediate and quite strong, but it did puzzle many of her friends. He was handsome enough and he seemed friendly, but her fellow trainees believed that Hella could get just about any man she wanted. She could do better. And Hella was very picky about appearances, but Richard was kind of scruffy for a pilot. Richard had been born in New York City. He had two younger sisters, Suzanne and Karen. Their father, John Andrew Crafts, had been a college football player and also a pilot during World War I. He was a stern disciplinarian with a short temper, and he drank, so he got a lot more stern when he was drunk. So he wasn't a witty and charming drunk. No, he maybe a mean drunk. A mean drunk. Yes. He became a successful certified public accountant, though, and started his own firm on Park Avenue in New York City, so he was no dummy. I and, imagine he did fairly well. Yeah. And this was a firm that he eventually sold to a major accounting company, so did pretty well with that as well. Now, by then, the family had moved to Darien, Connecticut, building a large house in an expensive section of town and joining the exclusive We Burn Country Club. Richard attended a private primary school, and his teacher's notes didn't report him as having any serious problems. The high school suspended him for having firecrackers on the premises once, and he was caught siphoning gas from a neighbor's car once. But that was about the extent of it. So he didn't seem like a murderer in the making. No, those certainly aren't too serious, are they? No. Now, a local kid described him as mean, though, 
and said that he threw ice balls and books at the younger children. So there we might have some red flags. Now he was also a bit of a hoarder. He liked to collect and save things. His family learned that they wouldn't send him to the dump because he'd come home with more than he'd left the house with. And he was known to have stashes of things in drawers like empty toothpaste tubes. So there's kind of an eccentricity for you. Just a bit, huh? Yeah, I don't know a lot about hoarders, but from the hoarding TV shows that I've watched on occasion, there's this thing about not wanting to let go of things, and a lot of it is memories, even in these mundane things like a tube of toothpaste. So it's a really interesting trait, I think. It is, and, and you have to, I think, remember that what they show you on TV is kind of, or these are the worst cases, so they can get the most viewers. Oh, yeah, they're going to send you the most interesting ones, yeah. Right. And these people are pretty severe, but... I don't think he was that far along. I just think the whole psychology of hoarding is an interesting one. It certainly is. Now, another trait that he had was his secretiveness. Not even his mother knew much about his friends or his activities. Back in August of 1956, he enlisted in the Marine Corps as a private with a five-year commitment. His parents were disappointed that he wasn't completing college, but he decided he wanted to fly planes. So he became a helicopter pilot, which indicates that he was probably in the bottom half of his class since jet fighters were flown by the higher-ranking students. So they had a hierarchy. The, yeah. The good students got the jets. Pretty much. And the average to below-average students flew the dumpy little helicopters. <laughs> I don't know how dumpy they are. I still think it's... Uh pretty hard thing to do. I think it's quite a skill. It is pretty cool. Yeah. And it's not that he never learned to fly a jet since he became a pilot for Eastern, but uh, when he was in the service, he was flying copters. Well, because that's what people wanted to do. So if you're higher up in the class, you have a choice more. That's all. Right. Now, in 1960, while he was still in the Marines, Crass volunteered for an assignment that took him to Taipei and to Northern Thailand. In Thailand, he helped train Laotian and Thai pilots and accompanied them on combat missions. So this is all the kind of secret stuff, CIA stuff. Yeah, that's fascinating. But I just can imagine you probably see some things that could change you as a person. No question. Yeah. And he did have a temper. He once went after his future brother-in-law with a two-by-four. Fortunately, he missed him, but he put a hole in a wall. Then after the service, for a while, he flew as a firefighter in Utah and Idaho, but he eventually quit because that work was too hazardous. No kidding. Yeah, that's really dangerous. Then he took a job flying tourists around Manhattan in a helicopter, and this led to work as an aerial photographer. Then Eastern hired him as a pilot in 1968. He flew the New York to Washington to Boston air shuttle. It was while he was in Florida for recertification for the DC-8 airplane, and that's where he met Hella. Yeah, Pan Am's flight attendants were based in New York, so they had easy access to international flights. And at first, Hella's group stayed in a Manhattan hotel with five or six women sharing a room. Now, this was too crowded, so Hella and four other women rented a large apartment over in Queens. And this wasn't huge, it only had three bedrooms. But since one of them was always off on a flight, the apartment did have a lot of living space. It was an improvement. Yeah, it was very manageable. Yes. But when they were down to three women there, they decided to separate. And one reason may have been that Richard Crafts was involved with Hella and one of the other women, one of the roommates. So that would be awkward. I think so. And even more awkward was that Grass was engaged to another person. So he's juggling at least three women at that time. Yeah, and I think throughout his life, there was a lot of juggling of relationships. It seems to be, yes. Now, Kratz called Hella one of his first extracurricular activities. Wow. Now, can you get much more insulting than that? He's a sweetheart, isn't he? Yeah. Well, we're going to find out he was quite an asshole, yeah. He was repeatedly unfaithful, but Hella stuck with him. She was crazy about him. With one of her roommates, she would drive to terminals at New York airports and wait for hours to see which woman Crafts would leave with. With his multiple partners and apparent charm, Crafts seemed to think very well of himself. Yeah, you think so? Well, sure. (laughs) Yeah. 
One flight attendant who went out with him for seven years was very aware that he had other girlfriends, including Hella, and she described him as a considerate lover. Now, what does that mean? The only thing I can think of with that is... A- <laughs> I'm not going to say. Well, I mean, really, th- that just means that you're going to give a woman an orgasm is the only thing I can see about that. Oh, you beat me to it. That you're not wham-bamming. Right. But big deal. I mean, it should always be that way, right? It should. It should. So it's just, to me, that's a funny term, a considerate lover. Well, I guess, then, as, as you said, it, it's that it's not just about him and getting a satisfaction. He wanted to be able to pleasure the woman, too. Well, you can look at it that way, but... How about if you look at it like it made him feel pretty good when he did that? Like, oh, look what I can do. I can make her, oh, no question. you know, toes curl or whatever the hell you want to call it. So it could work both ways. It's not necessarily selfless. No, I don't think it was. No. And it couldn't have been because he had a huge amount of lovers. That's so true. It, it couldn't be that he was interested in making sure that he was considerate to the woman he was banging. No, I've just always found that a very curious term. Me too. He was a cocky guy, but his most attractive trait, probably to a lot of these women, was how unattainable he seemed. Now, a lot of young women are attracted to men they can't have, and I guess it works the same way with the opposite sex. It doesn't really matter if you're a man or a woman. It can be attractive to get what you can't have, right? I was going to say that. Well, yes. I said it for you. Thank you. <laughs> But then there were also times when Crafts behaved very strangely. He would just walk away from the dinner table and cry for no apparent reason. And sometimes he woke up screaming in the middle of the night. So we do have some mental illness here, maybe some PTSD. You know, just armchair psychologist here. Well, he was covertly or otherwise working for the CIA. Air America, all that stuff. This this is pretty clandestine, potentially bad stuff going on. I wouldn't be surprised if he had some PTSD. Right. I mean, that seems like that kind of behavior. It does, When you it? have like an outburst like that that doesn't seem to match up with what's currently going on. Right. That can often be from that, from my understanding. So Richard alternated between rejecting and charming Hella. Her parents were impressed by him, but the relationship was a volatile one and was characterized by frequent fights. Off and on, one of those. Yep. So he'd go for months without seeing her, but they always got back together. And whenever a friend would ask her why she let him treat her so badly, Hella said she loved him, and she knew he would always come back. Well, that's a reason to hang on, isn't it? Yeah, well, you know, what can I say? There's really not a lot of sense in love sometimes, right? It's an emotion. Right. Right. But she would be miserable. But she would keep waiting for him. And for a long time, Hella believed that she was unable to get pregnant because she wasn't using birth control. And she was having sex with him for years, off and on. So they had this agreement that they would get married if she got pregnant. And from what I can tell from this is she wanted to get pregnant and get married. And he said, well, if you get pregnant, I'll marry you. We'll see what happens. Just kind of shitty. I don't feel like she was giving herself enough credit there. There's a self-esteem issue. Yes. Now she did conceive and the first time she conceived, Crafts actually beat her up and she ended up going and having an abortion. The second time he took off and left her for weeks and then he returned, but he still didn't want to marry her. So Hella scheduled an abortion that time, but then Crafts came back and said he wanted the child and he would marry her after all. So that's a pretty good foundation for a marriage, I think. It's a disaster. Yes. Yeah, it really is. And I think as she um, was in the marriage a while and got older, she realized that this marriage was just based on terrible things and was bound to not work out. Yeah, well, they, they pretty much led separate lives. They did, yeah. Even though they were married. They each had their own thing. They did. So they got married. The wedding took place in the New Hampshire home of Hella's friend, Flurcha a Dutch woman who was married to an Eastern pilot named David Smith. Hella had visited the place and enjoyed horseback riding with the Smiths. So when they got married, this was November 29, 1975, Crass was almost 39 years old, Hella was 28, and she was four months pregnant. The Smiths believed that Hella had used the pregnancy to make Crass marry her, and he told Hella that he doubted that the baby was even his. 
but he's a magnanimous guy, so he's going to marry her anyway. I know. It's just a terrible story, isn't it? It is. But, you know, he kind of viewed Hella as, for lack of a better word, a breeder. He planned to just kind of settle her in a country house, let her have children, and he'd continue to live as he wished. Because other women were always going to be part of his life. He wasn't going to give that up. And that was a major concern to Hella. But he really didn't seem to care much about her feelings. His attitude towards sex was quite casual, and his philosophy was not to seek out extramarital sex exactly, but he would never turn it down. So I don't know. That's just kind of <laughs> stupid. Well, I don't believe just, that. It's a real oxymoron. I mean, he might not be actively seeking sex, but if he's sitting in the bar or by the pool or wherever on a layover and he gets talking to a woman and it's apparent that they are interested in each other, he's going to have sex with her. And he did have some kind of magnetic personality or something that did draw the women in. Apparently. Yeah. So in 1976, the Crafts bought a house in Newtown. And the house wasn't fancy. It was situated in an average suburb within a few blocks of the shopping district there. Richard was frugal to a fault in many ways. And the home was heated by a wood stove in the basement for a very long time. Hella furnished the place in pretty good taste, but she had very little money to spend. And Richard refused to bring the furniture from his New York apartment to their home because he decided to keep that apartment as a place for him to get away. It was kind of a bachelor pad. Well, get away meaning a place to have sex. And not be a married man. Right. To stick with his single life. And he admitted to many people that he brought other women there, so it wasn't a big secret. I think Hella just lived a life of a lot of denial to try and get by, which is really sad. And to please her husband, Hella said she wanted to have perfect children, even though she knew that no children are perfect. When Crafts failed to appear for their daughter Christina's birth, Hella just went ahead and drove herself to the hospital, rather than bother anyone for a ride. So that's the kind of woman she was. And over the next several years, they did have a total of three kids. They had a home phone that was unlisted because Richard insisted. Yeah, now this is pre-cell phone, so everybody's in the phone book, and you had to pay money to be unlisted. And he insisted on that. Yeah, many people think this might have been so that his girlfriends couldn't call and and cause problems until I answered the phone. Well, sure. Now, neighbors of theirs, who didn't, didn't know the couple very well, for the most part, neighbors said that Hella was a bit aloof. And she struck some of the neighbors as a very nervous person. Well, if she's an abused woman, you're going to be nervous because you never know what the hell's going to happen next. Right. Now, Hella did become pretty close with one neighbor who was of a similar age and was also a mom. This neighbor once noticed that Hella had a black eye. When asked about the injury, Hella at first told her that she had bumped into a cabinet door. But she finally admitted that her husband had hit her and that it certainly was not the first time he'd done that. Now, strangely, though, Hella said, well, you know, Richard is really a good lover, though, as if that explained or excused the fact that he beat her. Well, we're back to that considerate lover. I don't get it. Me either. (laughs) But she did tell Betty that Richard was a really good lover, so I don't get it at all. Now, Hella stood out among her neighbors and her co-workers. She had this European style about her that made her seem very put together. And she seemed like a genuinely nice person. She was attractive, but not glamorous and private. Many people thought of her as a close friend, but she actually confided in very few people. They would have been surprised to learn that she was actually very lonely and living in an absolutely miserable marriage. But we know that it's not unusual for abused people to keep their suffering a secret. And I would imagine that's probably even more true back in the 80s, don't yeah. you? Absolutely. Oh, totally. Yeah. You know, of course, we've discussed domestic violence in many of the cases we cover, we've we covered. And basically, abuse in the home does lead to homicide. Not every time, of course, but often. And it's easy to picture yourself in an abusive marriage and believe that you'd be gone at the first instance of violence. But there are many things that really keep an abused spouse in the home. 
And there was really a lot tying Hella to her husband. They have three children. They share a home. And she told at least one friend that there were times when he was really a loving, kind person with her. And I mean, isn't that always the truth? Well, sometimes he can be so sweet. Well, sure. You, you know, the typical story is after the abuse, he's all apologetic. He's buying gifts. He swears he'll never do it again. That kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I once had a girlfriend who was in a verbally abusive relationship, and she would say things like about how nice he was at times, and I'd say, well, even Ted Bundy was nice sometimes. I mean, that's totally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. But it does seem to be something that abused people kind of fall back on, like, oh, it's not that bad. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. And there are also situational factors, like money and kids. And there's also a fear of being judged for not leaving sooner. Yeah, yeah. And then there is the very valid fear that when you do decide to leave, you're at the greatest risk of injury or death. That's a big one. It is. You know, there's still a lack of information about domestic violence, but we're in the 80s here. So it was much worse. Well, it was much more covered up or, or not discussed. Well, that's what I mean. People didn't know, right? right? It wasn't talked about as much. But what we actually do know was that after Helle finally became determined to get a divorce and leave Richard Crafts, that's the time she disappeared. Right, so there you go. As a flight attendant, Hella worked 80 hours a month in the air, and her longest trips lasted seven days. Now to that, add trips to and from airports and the hours that she spent recovering from jet lag. She was really busy, and she was often away from her husband. So like you said, they lived separate lives. Many neighbors and child care providers never saw Hella and Richard together with the children. Richard often didn't tell Hella where he even was. When a childhood friend came with her husband on a visit from Denmark once, they were really shocked that Richard didn't call Hella for four days while they were visiting. But that was how he lived. If he showed up, it was supposed to be appreciated or considered like a happy surprise. But when he didn't show up, he just didn't. And it wasn't something that Hella was to question. So for whatever her reasons, Hella accepted that as a normal part of her life and got used to it, I guess. Well, I think, as, as you said, that the couple lived two separate lives, basically. They, they shared a house and shared children, but they didn't interact that much. Right, but one thing that sticks out about this to me is she wasn't a stay-at-home mom. She was a career person. She was. She was dependent on a au pair or a sitter or a nanny or whatever. Mm -hmm. So an independent woman. Right. But still, she seemed like she was really held down by him, regardless of that. Still very controlled by him. So I think it doesn't matter how independent or brave or whatever you are in your career and your outside life, your home life can still really suck and you can still be a victim. So just because someone looks like they've got it all together doesn't mean that it's like that at home. I think that was the case with Hella. Right. It definitely was. Yeah. The combined earnings of the couple in the 80s was over 125000 That would put them in the top 5% during that decade. In 1984... Richard was diagnosed with colon cancer, and he was given less than a 5% chance of survival over the next two years. But he beat the odds and survived. Yeah, but while he was ill with the cancer, Hella was worried, and she started to take on side ventures to supplement their income. She had yard sales, and she sold Shakely products. Shakely is a multi-level marketing company that sells nutritional and health products, and they're still in existence today. I'll look them up. But what got to me about this is it's really not all that different from Thrive by Lavelle, in which Shanann Watts was very involved before she was murdered by her husband just last year. Well, I, I would describe these things as pyramid schemes. Yes, that's what an MLM is. Basically. Basically. I mean, some people make some money at it, but I think that Hella was not really making much money with it at all. No. But she really hoped one day that she could stop working as a flight attendant and spend more time at home. Richard's mom visited Thanksgiving of 1985, and the two women had an argument at the dinner table 
about Hella's extra work, extra jobs. Richard's mom complained that Hella had too many irons in the fire, but at the same time she didn't offer any money to help out, even though she was quite well off. Remember, Richard's dad sold that accounting company in New York, so they had some money. They did. They, they were quite comfortable. Yeah, but not sharing. Nope. I never understand that. If you're not going to share your money with your kids, what's the point? Exactly. Yeah, it's so weird. So here's Hella, married to a guy that all her friends considered to be a creep. They did. He cheated on her. He abused her, both emotionally and physically. However, when her friends would become too critical of him, she would defend him. I mean, that's her husband. She has to rationalize why she's there, and she has reasons why she's there. And that's the thing. I mean, you really can't go around criticizing a friend's spouse because they're going to hold that against you. They are. It's and too they, bad, but it's will. true. Yeah. Yep. So the other thing that Hella was bothered by was the appearance of her house. It was continually needing repairs, and, and Richard didn't, well, he, he wanted to start work on it, but he didn't want to finish work on it. I guess that's the simplest way to put it. Yeah, he didn't follow through. He could be generous with some people, but he wasn't with his wife. And even though he earned about three times more than Hella, he controlled her money, and he made her pay for the household expenses, the children's clothes, the nanny's salary, and her car. Well, he had other women he needed to think about here. Well, yeah, we got to budget ourselves here. That's right. He spent money on the things that pleased him, and this included an expensive gun collection. So he would plan to do work around the property, but rarely follow through with it. He had a $20,000 uh, backhoe, two riding lawnmowers, three chainsaws, a snowblower, a cement mixer, a tractor, and a lot of top-of-the-line tools. He also owned several shotguns, dozens of handguns, semi-automatic weapons, and thousands of rounds of ammunition. He spent hours each week on this gun collection, and he attended gun shows in Connecticut and New Jersey, buying more. So he was kind of fascinated with guns. Yes, he was. Yeah. So he had signed on as an auxiliary police officer in Newtown in 1982. While this was an unpaid position, Richard took it very seriously, and he would even respond to calls without being authorized. Then in 1986, he was hired on as a police officer in the nearby town of Southbury. This only paid $7 an hour, and he still worked for Eastern Airlines, but he loved the policing. He even bought a 1985 Crown Vic and outfitted it with radios, antennas, and lights and sirens at his own expense. Yes, yeah, so he's starting to sound a little crazy. A little well, unstable. You, know, you, you look at this stuff, and of course they don't know this, but here's this guy with an absolute arsenal of weapons. Yeah. And he's a cop. Right. Shit. Yeah. Well, when her friends said that they couldn't understand how Hella put up with him, Hella pointed out how good he was with the children, how helpful he could be around the neighborhood. And, you know, he holds a steady job. So he's, uh, what did they used to say? A good supporter? A good a, provider. A good provider, right. That was a big thing. Well, yeah, except he didn't share his money with her. No. So. Well, I mean, to a certain point, I guess. But, yeah. Right. Then in August of 86... Hella did finally decide to go ahead for a divorce. Still, she admitted to feeling guilty and uncertain of her choice. She would think, you know, am I being disloyal? She would ask her friends, am I going to hurt myself and my kids? What about health insurance? And where are we going to live? So all these legitimate, realistic concerns. Absolutely. But, you know, your safety and happiness have to come above that stuff. Well, yes. And I think most people know that now. At least I hope so. I don't think she ever thought that she was in any danger from him other uh, than, than the She eventually deals. did, I think. Maybe not early on, but once she filed for divorce, I think she had an inkling. Well, that's right, because she did tell people, if something happens to me, it's not an accident. Yeah. So. Well, in September of 86, she hired a private investigator named Keith Mayo. And he did confirm with pictures and everything that Crafts was having an affair. 
And that's when Hella did tell a family friend, if I disappear, it won't be an accident. So she was starting to think about her safety. Yes, she was. And she should have been. I mean, he was violent, and I'm sure he threatened her. So I think this is a good time to take a quick break for our sponsors before we get into Hella's actual disappearance and the follow-up investigation. Okay. So here we go. What's really great about credit cards is the freedom they give you to do the things in life that you really want and often really need to do. But of course, the downside is the high interest rates. You pay your bills, and if you have good credit, you shouldn't be paying crazy high interest rates just for the convenience of using your own credit card. Enter Lifestream. It's a simple way to save money with no piles of forms to fill out and no visit to a bank or lender. This can be done online in one day. Lifestream's goal is to make your life easier, not more complicated. Now you can get a low fixed rate credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream and pay off all those credit card balances. You can get a loan from $5,000 to $100,000 and you could get your money as soon as the day you apply. The average credit card company charges over 19% APR. But with Lightstream, you can get a fixed rate as low as 5.95% APR with AutoPay. Now you can pay off high interest credit cards and save money with a much lower rate. Apply today at lightstream.com slash brewery and get an additional interest rate discount. That's lightstream.com slash brewery. L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash brewery. Subject to credit approval. Rate includes a 0.5% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash brewery for more information. Cool. I'm always up for saving some money. Like how I save money while getting great hair color at home with Madison Reed Hair Color. You really can take your hair color to the next level at home for less than $25 with Madison Reed. Madison Reed gives you gorgeous, multidimensional, healthy hair with your choice of over 45 multitonal shades that have been developed by master colorists who really know how to blend nuances of cool, warm, light, and dark. Many of our listeners have written to tell me how Madison Reed hair color has improved their lives, and I totally get it. Madison Reed delivers gray-covering, natural-looking color right to my door. And now I'm free from salon visits, and I'm really saving a fortune if you think about it. So I'm always happy to recommend Madison Reed to our listeners. It's affordable, convenient, and it's super high quality. We're busy women, and we deserve gorgeous professional hair color delivered to our doors for less than $25. You can find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com, and True Crime Brewery listeners get 10% off, plus free shipping on their first color kit with our code BREWERY. That's code BREWERY at madison-reed.com. Give it a try. Why not? So back to the story. Richard Crass was continuing to get checkups every three months with his oncologist after his cancer went into remission. Now, in October of 1986, he lied to Hella, telling her that he was dying. So he might have done this for sympathy or maybe to keep Hella from leaving. But in the end, she did find out that he was still in remission and medically doing quite well. Even after he had lied to Hella about his imminent death, she had forgiven him, and they made an agreement. If he would agree to attend the children's parties, repair and maintain the house, and keep his distance from his girlfriend, he could live in the home until the divorce was finalized. One other stipulation was that she refused to have sex with him anymore. Well, good for her, right? Well... That's the least you can cut off, right? I think so. But he seemed to be going along with her demands. On the afternoon of November 14th, however, Hella called a friend very upset. Any hope she had of saving this marriage had ended that morning, she said, when she and Crafts had a really serious fight. Hella had found an insurance slip for a car that he had bought without telling her, and she believed that the car was purchased for one of his girlfriends. And one of his serious girlfriends was another um, flight attendant, who I believe she knew fairly well. Well, she certainly knew who she was. Yeah. Hella had stood up to him for the first time, really, that day. She didn't seem to care anymore if the children heard about the divorce. 
Hella's friends had been aware that she had hired a private investigator who'd taken photographs of Crafts and another woman. So she angrily told her husband that morning about the private investigator and what she had found out. Crafts then begged her to leave the girlfriend out of the divorce, but she refused because his infidelity would really be crucial if he attempted to get custody of the children. So that was the same day that Richard Crafts eluded the sheriff who came to try and serve him the divorce papers. So that was really the straw that broke the camel's back for her that day. And he wasn't having any of it. No, he wasn't. This is where things in his mind got more serious. Really off the rails. Although we don't really know how long he was planning things. There was a lot of planning involved in his crimes. To an extent. I mean, I don't think there was a lot. Well, maybe not years of planning, but certainly days. We know that on November 1st, 5, 9, and 11... Crafts was flying turnarounds, which are one-day trips. On Monday the 10th, a day when Heller was flying, he bought a new Ford dump truck for $15,000, and it was to be delivered on the 13th of November. It was to be used for spreading gravel on his lot's driveway, he said. Crafts asked the man who sold him the truck to install a hitch for towing heavy equipment. Now, this was an extra $350, which Crafts paid for in cash. You might think, why would he need a hitch? You don't need that to lay gravel. Then there was a fuel leak in the truck, and delivery was postponed to November 18th. Yeah, and he ended up with a rental. Also on November 10th, Crafts called a tree service and equipment rental company, and he was asking about large wood chippers to rent. He didn't want an average-sized wood chipper. He wanted the industrial size. On November 13th, he ordered a $375 Westinghouse chest freezer. And that day, he also drove to Brewster, New York, where he paid cash for a flathead shovel and a pair of fireproof gloves, avoiding other stores, of course, that are much closer to his home. You don't have to drive that far to get a shovel and gloves. Normally, right? Right. Plenty of places. Yes. On November 14th, he reserved a large wood chipper to be picked up on the 18th. And on the 17th, he went and got the freezer. He must have brought the freezer home when the children were still in school and the nanny was out of the house. The next morning was November 18th, and Hella returned home in the evening. The manager at the equipment rental company called the Crafts house about the wood chipper that he had reserved. And when Crafts showed up for the wood chipper... He said he wanted it because he was going to clear some land on his property. But he really rented a machine that wasn't considered suitable for use by a normal homeowner. This had the capacity to chip logs 12 inches in diameter. Some serious stuff here. It's huge, yeah. 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 So around 7 p.m. on November 20th, Joe Hine, hearing a loud noise, noticed a truck and wood chipper on Silver Bridge between Newtown and Southbury the chipper was being used. Visibility was not of the best because of snow. Yeah, there was actually a storm. Yeah, and Hein was driving a snowplow. Yeah, yep. So the truck's sliding rear door was open about three feet, and inside, Hein saw two piles of wood chips and some bags of plastic or cloth. Joe Hein also saw a man who, it seemed to him, was cowering between the truck and the chipper, almost like not wanting to be seen. The man wore an olive green poncho and a wide-brimmed hat similar to a police cap. Now, Hein did not stop. But at 4 a.m., another witness saw the truck with the wood chipper attached, and a Southbury police patrol car was behind it. He saw Crafts in a police raincoat, loading his police equipment into the passenger side of the truck. Now, on Saturday, November 22nd, Crafts worked as a pilot. He was a passenger to Miami, And then he worked a flight to San Juan and returned to Kennedy Airport around 9 p.m. that same day. He spent the night with a girlfriend in New Jersey. On Sunday, November 23rd, he flew the 4.30 p.m. flight from Kennedy to San Juan, and then he came back um, about 12.40 a.m. on Monday morning. Hella's friend Gertrude Horvath had dropped her off at her home on November 18th after a trip to Frankfurt, Germany. The family's live-in nanny, Dawn Marie Thomas, was out of the house. Yeah, and this wasn't a fun trip. This was a work trip. 
Yeah, this was a flight. This, this was a flight. Yeah. Now, Hella didn't show up for work the next day. And her friends were worried because they knew what she had told them. Yes. So they contacted a private investigator named Keith Mayo. And he started a missing persons investigation on his own. But no one believed that Hella had left on her own accord. No, as soon as she didn't show up for her flight, her friends knew something was wrong. She just doesn't do that. She was very reliable. She'd hired a divorce attorney, and according to her divorce attorney, Diane Anderson, most of her clients contact her often, especially in the beginning of the proceedings. But Hella Crafts hadn't called her. By Thanksgiving, attorney Anderson wondered why she hadn't heard from Hella, and she asked her secretary to contact Hella. The secretary was unable to reach her. So on the morning of December 1st, three calls came in to Hella's attorney, and each caller introduced themselves as friends of Hella Crafts, and they were all extremely worried. None of her friends had seen or heard from Hella since the 18th when she'd been dropped off by her friend after that flight from, was it Frankfurt? From Frankfurt, yes. Yep. So that's two weeks, basically. Yeah, it's been a while. And she missed Thanksgiving. Right. So for her to abandon her children was really unthinkable. She hadn't been at the family Thanksgiving, which is a dinner that she had planned. And in addition to all that, her husband had been giving some contradictory stories about her wear-up about her whereabouts, different stories to different people. So Diane, the attorney, looked into Helicraft's file, and she remembered that she said, if something happens to me, don't assume it was an accident. So now she's worried, and she called Keith Mayo, the PI, and talked to him. So Mayo decided to investigate, even if he would never be paid for his time. He had long held doubts about the effectiveness of the local police. He thought they were just giving him the runaround. Well, he knew that with a missing persons case, they weren't going to act quickly. Yeah, he knew it could take them weeks to respond to a missing persons case. Exactly. And he's pretty sure that there's foul play here. He is. In the meantime, though, Richard Crafts had gone to the police and filed a missing persons report. And he stated that Hella had left him after an argument. So Hella's friends were also concerned about the nanny, Dawn Marie Harris. If she knew something... Richard Crafts could do something to her, too. Right. And one night they couldn't find her. She wasn't working at McDonald's or wherever she was supposed to be. But she did end up being okay, thank goodness. But Dawn was found and brought in for questioning. And she told the PI her story. Hella, always precise about her schedule, which she had posted on a bulletin board in the kitchen, had noted that she would return to Kennedy from her trip to Frankfurt at 3.45 p.m. on November 18th. Dawn had been living with the Crafts since the past June, watching the children and doing housekeeping. And she also worked two part-time fast food jobs. Richard Crafts had given her the day off on November 18th. Now she came home for a short time that afternoon and Hella hadn't arrived. She drove to work in Hella's Toyota, which she was allowed to do and often did, because of the road conditions, because there was a snowstorm that day, and because she stopped to visit her boyfriend who was working at a local gas station, Dawn didn't return home until 2 a.m. She said she noticed then that Richard Kraft's pickup was not at the house. She entered the house through the garage, which opened into the basement. She turned off the porch light, and she may have looked in on the children in their rooms across the hall from the master bedroom. She wasn't sure about that, but she was sure that the master bedroom door was shut. So it all seemed fairly normal, and Dawn fell asleep in her bedroom around 2.30 a.m. Then at 6 a.m., Richard Crafts knocked on her door, wearing a robe and slippers. He seemed in a hurry, and he told her to get herself and the kids ready to go to his sister's house because they had lost power from the storm. Yeah, but Dawn wondered why he didn't just light a fire. They had a fireplace in wood, they had kerosene heaters... They also had a generator in the basement. Why indeed do we need to leave? Right. Anyway, the kids were quickly dressed and fed, and they all left the house. Not through the garage, which would have been easier, but through the front door, which the family rarely used. Dawn remembered seeing a set of footprints out there, but she didn't know whose they were. Hella's Toyota 
which Don had parked at the garage door, was now gone. Yeah, remember, Don had driven the Toyota the night before and got home at 2 a.m. Now she's up in the morning and the car's gone. Car's gone. Weird. But once outside, five-year-old Christina began crying because she had left her mittens in the house and she wanted to go back and get them. Richard threw her into the back of his pickup and refused to let anyone else go into the house for the mittens. So these are just all weird things that the nanny had noticed. Suspicious things. Yeah, and she had some other things that she thought were out of character. Sure. In the past few weeks, Richard had doted on the children. Now he's acting like a prick. There was a little bit of snow on the pickup's windshield as she climbed in, and she saw that the four-wheel drive was engaged, although Crafts usually didn't use it. So she figured he must have been driving during the night. Well, yeah, because there would have been more snow on the truck, for one thing. Right. And it probably wouldn't have been in four-wheel drive. Right, right. So she asked Crass where Hella was, and he answered, She left before us. She'll meet us at my sister's. Crass's sister Karen and her husband David Rogers lived in nearby Westport. Because of the snow-covered roads, the trip took longer than usual. And guess what? Hella wasn't at the Rogers' house. No. They got there. She wasn't there. She never showed up there, of course. So about 9 o'clock, Crafts left, 9 o'clock that same morning, to return to his house. And he called the Rogers phone about noon and told them that the electricity was still off. He called again at 3.30 that afternoon and said that the power had just come back on. He told Don and his sister Karen that his crown Vic was stuck sideways in the driveway. Then he returned to the Rogers' house not until 7 p.m., and he was driving the Crown Vic. So I guess he got it unstuck. Yeah, three and a half hours to get your car unstuck. It was sideways. (laughs) Yeah. So driving them back home from his sister's house, he was really tired. The nanny said he was dozing off and almost drifted off the road. She had to yell at him and shake him. So it sounds like he didn't get any sleep the night or the day beforehand. And each of these little things might be explained innocently. Maybe, but when you take them together, a couple other things. Dawn also told Private I Mayo there was a large dark stain that she had noticed in the carpet just before Crafts removed it. And she also said that the large freezer that was uh, in the garage was missing. Yeah, they never did find that. Nope. During his investigation, Keith Mayo learned that on November 23rd, Richard Crafts went to a store in Newton and ordered carpeting for three of the bedrooms. He also ordered replacement under padding. The total cost was $1,500, which he paid a third of, like a deposit, on his MasterCard. And on November 26th, a man went to the house to measure those rooms. On December 4th, Crafts came back to the store with his son, Andrew. The carpet hadn't been delivered yet, and he told the clerk that he was going to remove the old carpet and padding on his own. He didn't need them to do that. But the measuring man had noted that when he went to measure, the old carpeting and padding was already gone. So that had been ripped out like a week earlier. Well, certainly before they got there, right? Before they went to measure, yeah. Yeah. Now, also that same day, Crafts re-rented the wood chipper. He planned to return it the following afternoon, and he also inquired about a steam cleaner, but I'm not sure if he ended up renting that. And then on December 4th, Crafts arrived at the Newtown Police Department, and he wrote and signed a statement, and he then agreed to take a polygraph test. Crafts had taken a polygraph back when he joined the Southbury Police, and the detective checked the file, and conferred with the examiner who'd given it. The polygraphist said, You'll see he doesn't show any response. I've only had one other subject whose response was so flat. So he remembered that about him, or he'd taken notes on it. It struck a chord in him, didn't it? Well, I think you do have to have a conscience and concern about getting caught in order for the polygraph to work. Now me, I don't think I'd ever pass it, because I just feel guilty all the time, even when I've done nothing. Well, and there's some question about his time with Air America, whether he was taught how to cheat on the lie detector. Yeah, well, that would kind of make sense if you're like a spy. Right. Yeah, true. Plus, the questioning wasn't great, I guess. 
He was able to read the questions in advance, so he was kind of prepared. And he was attached to the machine, which produced four graphs, which measured heartbeat, blood pressure, respiration, and sweating. So the questions. The first one was, were you born in the U.S.? The second was, was Wednesday the 19th at about 6 a.m. the last time you saw your wife? Which is what he had said. And they asked, did he know of her location? They asked, did he kill her? They asked, in your entire life, have you ever hurt anyone? And they asked, the last time you saw Hella, was she all right? They also asked, did you have someone kill Hella? Have you told me the complete truth about Hella's whereabouts? So I don't know about these questions, Dick, because I'm thinking, do you know for certain your wife's present location? I think you could say no, because if he would chipped her, he wouldn't really know where she was exactly. <laughs> well, she's strewn all over the place. Well, I mean, seriously. It depends how his mind worked. Yeah. But anyway, he was also given doubt verification tests with cards bearing numbers where he was told to lie so they could kind of get, you know, a baseline. Then the nine questions were presented again and a third time with the order moved around so he couldn't have like a habitual response. But in the end, it was determined that he showed no deception. The administrator thought he was way too cool to show a reaction to anything, though. And then there were other possibilities, I guess. Since he'd taken the polygraph before, he might have been familiar enough with how to control his responses, like you said. He might have even been trained in that. Yeah, they, they spent some time discussing that. I think that's a strong possibility. Also, if you're like a cool cucumber, and you know the results of a polygraph can't be admissible in court, Maybe you wouldn't really be that afraid about taking it. I mean, if you don't give a shit what the police that you're with there think, you might be pretty relaxed because you know they can't take it to court. You're right. Also, if he really believed he'd committed the perfect murder by destroying her body, maybe he didn't feel frightened at all that he'd get caught. Another thing is that police really only had superficial knowledge. They thought she was murdered, but they had no idea how he would have murdered her. So the questions weren't able to get that particular. No, they were kind of general questions, weren't they? Yeah, but we can say all this, but still, passing a lie detector test works in your favor. It sure does. I mean, mm -hmm. many police and even the PI doubted then maybe he really hadn't murdered her. Maybe. I mean, it, it certainly, passing a lie detector test does help in the minds of the police investigating the crime. Absolutely. And, and if word gets around the town... It helps with him being thought of as innocent. Yeah, the whole public opinion can change based on that. Right. So even though there was a lot of suspicion, nobody had any evidence that Hella had been killed. The suspicions became stronger when the witness, Joseph Hine, reported to police that he had seen Richard Crafts operating the large wood chipper in the remote location overlooking the Housatonic River during a snowstorm. Because that's an odd thing to do. I mean, in any circumstance, right? That's just bizarre. Well, it's bizarre to be operating a wood chipper at whatever hour of the morning it was, in the location it was. Then you add a snowstorm. And I wouldn't think that's something that you usually do alone, especially an industrial-sized wood chipper. No. Well, further investigation, of course, revealed that he'd been cheating on Hella. And also he was acting strangely with the hoarding of firearms. Mayo and the police began to agree with Hella's friends that Richard probably had killed her, likely dismembered her with his chainsaw, and shredded her with the wood chipper into the river, even though this is almost unthinkable. It's a process to get your mind wrapped around that, that anyone would do that. Isn't it? It really is. So Dr. Henry Lee, who we've talked about many times in our cases... Yeah, he's been involved in many famous crimes, many notorious crimes. So at, at this time, he was the director of the Connecticut State Forensics Lab. So he went with police to search the Kraft's house. On the master bedroom mattress, he found five tiny dark stains, which were nearly invisible to the naked eye. Testing proved it was human blood, and it was blood of the same type as Hella. Well, testing was also able to confirm that it was blood from the circulation and not menstrual blood. Yeah, I just don't know how you can do that. I don't know. So I was going to leave it out. But that's what Henry Lee said, so I'm going to go with it, Dick. All right. 
because I think that's important. I think a lot of women have old blood stains, you know, here and there from menstruation. But he could tell that this was circulating blood from an injury. And part of it might have been the direction of the blood, because he was able to conclude that the blood hit the mattress at an angle of 10 degrees at medium velocity. Maybe a period wouldn't do that. Right. Right. And th there was a, a blood smear on the side of the mattress, and Dr. Lee felt this was consistent with being hit on the head with a blunt object. As the, as the person fell, uh, the head brushed the side of the mattress. Yeah. Causing that. So they also found that the bath towels in the home had been washed recently. Testing notes showed that the towels had been soaked in blood. So it looks like something happened in that household. Definitely. But there's no body. There's no witness. There's no weapon. Investigators needed more to prove that Hella was even dead. And then furthermore, that she had been murdered. So they went to where the witness had seen the wood chipper during the snowstorm, and police searched the riverbank. All they found at first were mounds of wood chips, but they found a piece of an envelope, which was mail, that was actually addressed to Mrs. Hella Crafts. So there you go. Yeah. Then they began to find little clumps of blonde hair. One policeman told his boss that if Richard Crafts did what he thought he had done to his wife's body, then it was time for him to retire. He was out. And that really struck me that he said that, because I can imagine feeling that way, like this is just a bridge too far for me. Well, can you imagine being reduced to pieces that are millimeters in size? No, and this is someone, this was his wife, the mother of his children. It's It really is just unimaginable. It is. Now, with further uh, looking... Searching. With further searching, they discovered blue fibers, a great piece of metal, which ended up being from a tooth filling, and multiple tiny bone fragments. Then when some of the snow had melted, they found a painted fingernail with some flesh on it among the leaves. Yeah, and I think that ended up being maybe like the baby toe or something, so it wasn't big. Divers searched the river, and on the bottom they found pieces of a chainsaw. The serial number had been scratched off. As forensics examined this evidence, the case was becoming national news. So Richard Crafts was definitely a suspect, but he continued to deny doing anything to Hella. The chainsaw, though, had some human hair, some tissue, and a tiny, tiny piece of fiber in it. The fiber was the same color and fabric as Hella's favorite nightshirt. And it also matched other fibers that were found at the river. But since the serial number was scratched off of the saw, that made it impossible to identify it as belonging to Richard Crafts. But then they had this chemical solution they used, which would eat away the outer layers and reveal the serial number. And we've seen this in other cases where, mostly with guns, where the number had been etched off. And the number matched the warranty card that Richard Crafts had sent into the company after he purchased the saw. Now, to me, that's just dumb that you're going to use a <laughs> saw that you've signed a warranty that you possess it. Yeah, that's his obsessive compulsive behavior, I guess. I guess. And who knows when he bought it? It could have been years old. The investigators also compared hair from Hella's hairbrush to the hair found near the river and in the saw. They concluded that the hairs were microscopically similar. Yeah, now hair is not 100%. But from what I was reading, she did have kind of an unusual structure to the hair that you don't see that often in head hair that made them feel more certain it was hers. Well, yeah, but that's still, compared to what can be done these days, Well, sure. it's minuscule. So no. the, the best you can say is they look similar. Yeah, similar structure, similar color, all that. Right. The polish on the fingernail they found at the site was compared chemically to a bottle of Hella's nail polish from her house. So the organic compounds in both polishes matched, but this still didn't prove she was dead. And I wonder how different are nail polish components. But, you know, they're just kind of putting together these hints, but none of these are going to convict him. Nope. The bones found at the river had apparently gone through a wood chipper. So Dr. Lee and the forensics team rented the chipper, and they put a pig carcass through it for comparison, which is just awful. Done in the name of science. 
So there was a signature type of cut that matched the cutting pattern on the debris that had been found at the river. Among some of the pieces found were millimeter-sized fragments of bone, and investigators could determine that some of the fragments were human, tiny grooves in the bones that were created by blood vessels inside the top of the skull is something only humans have. So that's fascinating. So they couldn't determine if Hella had been dead before going into the wood chipper? Well, let's hope so. Or after. But the important thing was that they now knew a human being was dead. Now the next thing they needed to know was who. And this was before the science of DNA was well established. Yeah. So if you're not going to have a body, you have to at least have proof that Hella is dead. As much as you can, right? Yeah, as far as you can, that's right. So what they did is they had bone fragments that they were frozen with liquid nitrogen, and then they ground them to a fine powder. Tests revealed that the bones came from a person with Helicraft's blood type. Then there was this gray piece of metal that was believed to be a crown to a tooth, but there were no human remains on the crown, so they still needed more to make an identification. I think it's fascinating the steps they went through to get to the point they did. Oh, it is. I mean, it's like real detective work, huh? Hard work, yeah. So they continued to be searching the river and the banks, and they finally found a tooth that seemed to match to the crown that they had. And then they were able to match the tooth and the crown to Hella's dental x-rays that were, had been taken between 1982 and 1986. So is Hella's tooth. Yeah, so this proves that she was dead because the teeth were extracted from her skull under severe trauma. I mean, we know that tooth didn't just fall out. Right. Right, so that's really what we needed. I mean, we all think she was dead, of course, because where the hell is she, right? Right. But that's all circumstantial and not completely convincing. But they could tell from the way that the bone fragments and the tooth had been extracted from the body, that there was violence involved. Quite. And of course, from the bones, you only know it was someone with her blood type. But now we have some definite proof it was her from the dental x-rays. So I think that's just amazing. 30 years ago. Yeah, now it would probably be much simpler. You just do the DNA test on a piece of bone and you're done. You got it. So they did tests on tissue-like material that had been found in the back of Richard's truck that he had rented. And these tests came back positive as being from human remains. And the missing freezer has never been found. No. So it was January, January 13th of 87. So not that much time had passed when Richard was arrested and he was held on $750,000 bail. Due to the publicity the case had received, prosecutors had to move the trial to New London, Connecticut. Their motive was that Richard had killed Hella because he hadn't wanted a divorce, mostly because he didn't want to lose the money that he would lose by paying her alimony and paying for child support. Which he would. <laughs> yeah. He had well, committed adultery, so he was, he was going to be paying alimony and child support. Maybe more. Well, absolutely. Plus, I don't think that it was... There could have been some anger involved because he was violent and an abuser. But all this planning makes me feel like it was more because he didn't want the divorce and he wanted to save money. Yes. So in order to prove this case, the prosecutors went over the chain of events leading up to and following Hella's disappearance. So they went over how on November 13th, Richard had ordered the new freezer, the one that's never been recovered. And the dealer was brought in and testified in court that Richard had refused to give a name or address and that he had insisted on paying in cash, and he didn't want it delivered, which was unusual for this big type of freezer. He wanted to pick it up himself. That's unusual. Mm -hmm. Now, the nanny, Dawn, was also brought in to testify, and she told jurors that she heard Hella and Richard fighting on November 14th, and since then, Hella had been noticeably upset. And according to the prosecutors, on the night of her disappearance, Hella put the children to bed around 8 o'clock, and then she changed into her nightshirt, which matched the blue fibers found on the riverbank. And once in the master bedroom, Richard struck her head with his police flashlight, then wrapped her body in the bedsheets 
and stuffed her into the freezer in the garage. He then returned to the bedroom to clean up the blood stain on the carpet using the bathroom towels. Then after dropping off Don and the kids at his sister's house, Richard returned home where he took Hella's body out of the freezer and transported it in the rear of the truck and transported it in the rental truck to the Housatonic River where he re- dismembered her body with a chainsaw and ran it through the wood chipper. Since her body was frozen, there was basically no blood splatter. And afterwards, he took apart the chainsaw, scratched out the serial number, and threw it into the river. So this is all, we don't know exactly, but that's how they put it together with the evidence. It seems pretty right. Yeah, it seems to make a lot of sense. I mean, there are some details we'll never know. But after the prosecution rested its case, Richard decided to take the stand in his own defense. And of course, he denied that he had killed Hella. After a few days of deliberation, the tr- this trial was a mistrial. And this was just because and this was because just one of the jurors was unable to convict Richard of the murder. There was a second trial, of course, and that happened in November of 1989. This time, Richard was found guilty after eight hours of deliberations. He got 50 years in prison as a sentence. Yes, I read someplace he's eligible for parole in 2021. Which is pretty soon. Soon. Yep. And the trial was the first to allow cameras in the courtroom. It was also the first murder conviction in Connecticut without a body. Yeah, and if those of you who have seen Fargo might remember a scene in that movie involving a wood chipper. And this probably inspired Joel and Ethan Cohen to uh, write that into their script. Yes, I believe they've said that's the case. So where can we find out more about this? I think it was interesting that the very first episode of Forensic Files, you know, not just the first in a season, but the first in the whole series, the pilot episode of Forensic Files, was about this case. It was, the very first one. Then in 1997, New Detectives covered this case in an episode titled Body of Evidence. Yep, in 1998, the case was also featured on the History Channel series Crime Stories. And then in July 2012, Investigation Discovery went over this investigation again in their Blood, Lies, and Alibis episode entitled Wood Chipper Killer. And the big focus of this, which it pretty much was with forensic files as well, was the forensic analysis of this case, because it is fascinating the way that they put this together. Of course, there's also a book on this case, which was titled The Wood Chipper Murder, and that's by Arthur Herzog. So I'll put a link to the book in our show notes in case anyone is interested in reading it. Just a quick reminder that we have lots of TCB merchandise available. If you click on Shop the Brewery on our website, tiegrabber.com, you can click on our Tee Public link to get your summer t-shirts and tanks with your choice of true crime brewery designs, colors, and sizes. They also have phone cases, hoodies, mugs, pillows, just about anything. But it's worth a look. Yeah, I'm also hoping to get some like beer cozies or some floaty ones to take out by the pool. That would be neat. <laughs> Always thinking. Yep. Then I also want to let you know about a new company I recently found. It's called Nativo Condiments and Seasonings, and they offer a variety of spicy blends of Argentine heritage that I absolutely guarantee will jazz up your meals. I made a lentil chili recently and used the Spice the Sea blend. Besides salt, it has onion, garlic, nutmeg, pepper, and paprika, which I thought was perfect for my chili. Good chili. Of course, along with some additional chili powder and cumin and stuff, but anyway... And I just can't wait to try their other spice blends. They also offer a recipe of the week, which gives specific food and blend recommendations. So go to argentinechef.com to explore and order. And for a limited time, enter coupon code Nativo Ships Free for free shipping of orders over $10. That's argentinechef.com, N A T I V O S H I P S F R E E. Try them, you'll like them. Our music for True Crime Brewery was written and produced by Tristan Capel. Just a quick reminder about Team Tie Grabber. It's a way for you to give support to the podcast and get an extra episode of TCB each month. 
As soon as you join, you receive an email with login information and a link, and that allows you to add our members-only show to your podcast app. Then, of course, you'll have access to all of our past members-only episodes, in addition to the new ones as they come out. In March, we covered the case of Robert Raldan. This was the charmer guy who was a little Ted Bundy-ish, and you could kind of see the progression of his evil as he got older. And he was very much enabled, I believe, by his good looks and by his wealthy family members who kept getting him out of jail and defending him. Then in April, we covered and released a case from Alaska. This was the case of Lori Waterman. She was brutally murdered by two men who were friends, lovers, I guess, of her teenage daughter. And the daughter, Rochelle, had apparently told these guys that her mother was abusing her and that they were going to protect her by killing the mother. So why they decided that murder was the solution, I can only guess that they were idiots, cruel idiots. Still, the punishment, or rather the lack of punishment that this girl received, defies all reason, and we had quite a discussion about that. Yes, we did. We really did. (laughs) Now this month, our members-only episode is the story of Lorencia Bembenek. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Dick? She was a uh, Milwaukee police officer who was kicked off the force for bad conduct and ended up being charged with the murder of her husband's ex-wife. She was found guilty and put in prison. She escaped, was on the run for a while. Don't give it all away. (laughs) uh, And inspired the theme, Run Bambi Run. And this was uh, recommended by a lot of people. This has been recommended to us for a couple of years. Yeah, so... It's a fascinating case. Yeah, I'm glad we're finally doing it. And one more thing, if you have a couple minutes to spare, we would greatly appreciate it if you could leave a review for us on iTunes or wherever you listen. More positive reviews helps more people to find our podcast, which, you know, we like. It's a good thing. So now we're moving on to feedback. You can email your feedback to us at truecrimebrewery at tigrever.com. Or you can leave a voicemail with your comments or case suggestion by clicking on Leave a Voicemail on the homepage of our website, tigrabber.com. Okay, I guess that's enough going on and on about ourselves. Let's do feedback and hear what people have to say. We were away for a couple weeks. We were. And guess what? There was a lot of voicemails that had been left for us. You know, there were a lot of voicemails and a ton of members. We should take yep. time off more often. I guess so. I guess absence makes the heart grow fonder. There are more emails than I could count. So some of these are going to be on today's feedback. Others will be on future feedbacks, and some I'm just going to summarize. I just hope my summary will be a little more accurate than Attorney General Barr's summary of the Mueller report. Ooh, you burnt. Gotcha. So first, thanks to Bridget, Claudia, Kim, Sam, and Jessica for their very kind comments, embarrassingly kind comments. That's why we're not playing them, but we love to listen to them. We do. So Claudia and Sam also mentioned that they are high school students. So I think we've discovered a new demographic for the show. That is so cool. (laughs) I have to admit I'm pretty surprised by that, but I like it. These must be old souls. They must be. Well, they sound, I don't want to say old. They sound pretty mature. Wise. Wise beyond their years. Definitely. I also want to say thanks to Zach for his case suggestion and his beer suggestion. I love Three Floyds. They make some great beers. Now, unfortunately, we can't play everyone's voicemails. Otherwise, we'd have about a seven-hour episode. But we do want to express our appreciation to everyone that left us a voicemail. Sure, because I never thought we'd be at the point where we wouldn't play them all. I was always begging for them. Be careful what you wish for. Nah, I love them. Even if we don't play them, we listen to all of them and we appreciate them for sure. So we have two voicemails to hear today. Okay. We have a uh, first one's from Kara and she's going to comment on the bathtub murder. Okay. Do you need to say anything more specific about what the bathtub murder is or does she get into that? I just thought everyone knew that. Mm, no, <laughs> many people have been murdered in bathtubs, unfortunately, and we've covered at least three of them. Well, this is the bathtub murder where the husband was accused of killing his young wife and uh, was convicted. Is that more specific? Sure. It's the case of Ryan Widmer for killing his wife, Sarah Widmer. And he was found guilty, but he's appealed. And there's been some controversy about the case in the media. 
Hey, Dick and Jill. My name is Kara from South Dakota. Uh, I want to say that I very much enjoy you guys. Since I found you a couple of months ago, I have been binge watching or binge listening, I should say, and have uh, you're my go to. I have enjoyed every episode you guys have done, even the mistake one. I was calling because I had just got done listening to the bathtub murders and had a couple of thoughts on the, the bathtub murders. First is if he's pulling her out of the tub, whether he's got clothes on or not, that could transfer a lot of the water off of her. And then if he's laying her down on the on the floor, you know, there's no telling how she was placed on the floor. So as far as her body being drier than they thought that that just seems a little bit reaching to me. Also, I clean for a living. I clean houses by day and businesses at night. And as somebody who makes their living leaning over tubs, uh, the placement of the bruising seems very weird to me. Uh, bruise high on the sternum is going to be a really weird spot if you're holding somebody's head underwater. When you're leaning over a tub, you usually, especially if you're getting a head underwater, it's going to be further down on your chest, maybe even in the abdomen type area. And then two, I was thinking as far as the fingerprint evidence and the used Lysol thing, she might have been wiping the tub out. A lot of us ladies, we like to wipe down the tub real quick after we've used our, our bath the last time because we use oils or salts or something. You know, the, the downward motions and the pushings and the stuff like that. And even the forearm print could have been from her wiping out the tub. And she might have even gotten bruised, and wet, bruised while leaning over the tub. And then it just showed up because of the drowning. And then to the bruises on her head, with her being a gentle hygienist, they have those lamps that they use. I clean dental offices by night, and I can tell you that a lot of times you lose track of where those hanging lamps are, and I've hit my head on those many times. And front head, back head, side head, wherever. And they often do have rounded handles or rounded edges, which would be consistent with what the bruise expert was talking about. But those were just some thoughts that I had while listening about it. And it just seemed like a lot of the evidence was circumstantial and reaching. And I just wanted to call and contribute. Thank you so much for what you guys do. Please continue doing it. And we look forward to hearing you guys down at the quiet end. Well, thanks, Kara. Now, I really enjoy this voicemail because I like the detail and the thought that she's put into this. Well, that's why I included this. I mean, it, it's obvious that Kara's put in a lot of thought on this. So just the idea that we got someone thinking yeah. is pretty cool. Now, the disadvantage for me here is I really don't remember what I said about it at the time. <laughs> but... Well, I think in, in a nutshell, yeah, we didn't think he was guilty. or We, we thought it was unlikely that he was guilty. We well, weren't convinced. Yeah, it wasn't a slam dunk, was it? No. And to me, the whole whether you're wet or not, yeah, I think that's very reaching, Kara. I think a lot of it was a reach. If I'm remembering correctly, this is the one where they brought the bathtub into the courtroom that was dusted for fingerprints. Yes. Yeah, the fingerprints mean nothing to me. I mean, you're always, at least I am, I'm always wiping the tub or leaning over to grab something or... I mean, great point that you use oils and things. I use bath bombs, so I can't just take a bath and leave it or it's going to be, you know, kind of slimy. So I really appreciate that, Kara. Thank you very much. I think you've got some great points there. Yeah, thanks, Kara. Then we have Cindy, who has a case suggestion for us. Hello, Dick. Hello, Jill. This is Cindy in Georgia. I left you two a message about three or four weeks ago, but I did not leave a case suggestion because I said that you two um, probably had more than enough. But I do have a, a suggestion for a case that happened where I live in Carrollton, Georgia, back in 04. Um, eight-year-old Amy Yates was killed in her neighborhood while riding her bike. I used to work with her mother, so I know her personally. There was a 2020 or Dateline special on this back in seven I believe called a killing in Carrollton and there's plenty of um, newspaper articles that you too can research if you decide to look into this but it's just tragic just tragic case with um, Amy Yates uh, her death not knowing who it was then years later her sister um, her younger sister who by this time was about 14 15 she um, committed suicide by jumping off a parking deck here in our town square just a sad situation all around tragedy after tragedy in that family would definitely be a, a good case to review so um, thank you for always showing respect to every case that you two discuss and um, I look forward to hearing more from you in the years to come have a great day well thank you very much Cindy yeah, this was an interesting case. This is a little eight-year-old who went missing. 
and the uh, police questioned some boys from the neighborhood, one of whom was a 12-year-old named Jonathan Adams. And they questioned this kid for uh, like an hour and a half, two hours or more. No attorney or what about no, the parents? No parent, no attorney. And that the is amazing, kid disgusting. Conf confessed to accidentally killing Amy. Wow. So when the parents were allowed to speak with him after his confession, he retracted the confession. Strange, huh? Well, how did the parents let him go in and talk to police in I the first place? don't know. I think they were probably told that it was just to get some facts down. Well, and I can kind of see that, right? A kid that young, you're not going to think police are going to try and set him up as a murderer. So even though he retracted the statement and there was uh, accusations of police coercion, a judge ruled that his statement could be used as evidence, uh, and he was held in a juvenile detention center until his murder conviction in 2005, and then he was moved to a rehab center. Here's where it gets a little more interesting. Two years after the crime, a mentally disabled teenager confessed to killing Amy, although he too later retracted his statement. And do we know what he had for support, or we haven't really looked that deeply yet? We haven't yet? looked that deeply. Okay. So the police and prosecution claim they got it right the first time, but a grand jury and a judge who investigated the case eventually exonerated the first kid and indicted the second kid on manslaughter charges. But in four years afterwards, the charges were formally dropped. So there's nobody. So there's nobody, and the case is still unsolved. Now, the father uh, was quite critical of how... The father of the victim? The father of the victim was quite critical of how the um, case was prosecuted and investigated. Well, yeah, I could see that. I mean, do we even know what the motivation here was? Nope. So he pushed for a law, and it did get passed. It's called Amy's Law, and it's a Georgia state law that was passed in response to the outrage generated when a 12-year-old convicted of murdering Amy was sentenced to two years in juvenile prison which at the time was the maximum penalty allowed for minors in Georgia. So now Amy's law permits sentencing of juveniles to being incarcerated until age 21, if convicted of murder. I don't know. Does that really make a big difference? What do you think of that? I don't think it makes a huge difference. No. I mean, I think if, I don't know, putting a kid that young into juvenile detention could destroy the kid for life, especially if he's innocent. But then also... Just thinking about Cindy's comments on the case, thinking about the sibling committing suicide, it just always makes me think of how you don't just have the victim. You have the victim's family. You don't just have the one who's convicted, whether they're innocent or not. You have their family that suffers. If one person's murdered. It's just like waves and waves of people whose lives are affected, if not destroyed. Right. We talked about it one time. It's like peeling an onion and all the different layers that you come across. It's horrible, yeah. I mean, I'm sure we're not the first people to mention that at all, but it is something to think about. It is. Okay, I think we have a couple emails I now that we'd like emails. to read. You get the first one. I get the first one from Stevie, a case suggestion. Yep. Stevie writes, I recently started listening to the podcast and I can't get enough. I got an idea for a case suggestion after reading the true crime novel Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil by John Barrent. It is about a lot of different characters in Savannah, Georgia in the early 80s, but it centers around the Jim Williams shooting case. In 1981, Williams shot his young assistant, Danny Hansford, during an argument. Williams claimed he acted in self-defense and that Hansford had fired a gun at him. This case is a tangled web of contradicting evidence. When he was first convicted, the prosecution used the fact that no gunpowder residue was found on Danny's hands to prove that Hansford had not fired a gun at all that night and that Williams had set up the scene. Later, it was discovered that the police had not bagged Danny's hands prior to taking his body for autopsy. Also, a nurse in the morgue bagged his hands in plastic effectively destroying any possibility that gun resi residue would be found. This evidence was hidden from the defense by the prosecution. There are many more interesting pieces of evidence for and against the self-defense case in the novel. 
The most surprising thing about this case is that Williams went to trial four separate times for the same crime, eventually being acquitted in the fourth trial. He was the first person in the state of Georgia to be tried this many times. Williams died in 1990, and it's rumored that he fell dead in the same spot where Danny Hansford had been shot eight years earlier. Pretty cool. Not in a good way, but interesting. <laughs> cool in an interesting way. I mean, I hate to say cool, but you know what I mean. I do. It's fascinating. I need a I, thesaurus. I didn't read the book. I did see the movie. Yeah. Kevin Spacey. Good movie? John Cusack. And a bit of trivia for you. Okay. The director of this movie was Clint Eastwood. Oh, one of his earlier ones. Yeah, it was a very well-done movie. Also, Stevie adds a little beer information. As far as beer is concerned, there's a brewery called Southbound Brewing Company just outside the historic district of Savannah. But I don't know anything about the beer they produce. Me either. <laughs> now, I've only been to Savannah once, but what a gorgeous place. I'd love to go back. It is a nice place. Really different, yeah. Well, I think we should look into that and... Visit that brewery. That's my suggestion. Okay. All right. We'll head for the low country. Okay. And how about our final email? Why don't you read that for us? This is from Marla, and she has a couple case suggestions. So Marla said she found our podcast on Pandora about six months ago and stopped looking for any other true crime podcast to listen to. I love you, Marla. She then goes on. I'm going to skip over some more praise. <laughs> and okay. said, Marla has two cases for us, two Nebraska cases. The first is the case of Gina Boss, who went missing from outside a Lincoln, Nebraska bar in October 2000. She's never been found. And as far as I know, Marla, the police have never named a suspect. And I don't believe we've done a Nebraska case off the top of my head. Uh, I know we haven't. Okay. Then the second case is the murders of Wayne and Sharman Stock. They lived in the rural town of Murdoch, and this was a pretty highly publicized case. It's complete with false confessions, planted evidence, and the conviction of the lead CSI investigator. Wow, that's something. Isn't that cool? Well, I just, there we, we need a thesaurus. I believe that there was a Dateline episode about it, and there is a book titled Bloody Lies. I would love to hear your take on either or both of these cases. Sounds good. Very, very good. Thank you. Marla also has some beer recommendations, so she suggests Empyrean Brewing in Lincoln, and her favorite is a winter seasonal called Fallen Angel. That's a cool name. Chocolate Stout. She also likes their Long Route Peanut Butter Porter. Now, the peanut butter ones always sound good, but I haven't found one I really like yet. I haven't been a big fan yet of but peanut butter. But I'm not butter. giving up. We'll keep trying. It's one of my favorite foods, so there has to be a beer that I'll like. And she has another beer recommendation from Infusion Brewing in Omaha. Her favorites there are Dominican Brown Ale and the Vanilla Bean Blonde. So now that we have some cases in Nebraska, when we do them, I've got beers to try. And how fun would it be to take a trip to Nebraska? I've never been to that part of the country. And I know it has a rep for being kind of boring, but I don't care. I'd like to go. Well, there's so much to see in this country anyway. Right, exactly. So, there's always stuff to see. That's right. So and good. it can't be, it has to be pretty different from New Mexico. Road trip. All right, there we go. Okay. All right, well, thank you everyone for your feedback and for listening to us today. We really did miss you. And thanks to everyone who wrote and said they missed us. And even a few people were worried about us. So that's super nice. Yeah, but you see, we're both alive. I didn't do anything to Jill and dispose of her body. <laughs> Wouldn't that be ironic, huh? <laughs> Let's not do that. Uh, no. Okay. But we will see you next time at the quiet end. We'll meet you there. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.